I'd like to hear it. Amen. So just so you know, when you're praying for stuff, folks, God still answers prayer. Amen. He's still in the prayer answering business. Amen. I'm going to get directly to the word. I apologize. Michelle and Jacob are not here today. Uh, uh, Kylie is gone. She is. She is. Um, she has left us. Amen. Uh, she went on vacation with my sister-in-law. Amen. And so, uh, well, I didn't realize I'd have a hard enough time with her leaving. I was struggling with that. That's really hard to let them go. I almost pulled her out of the car. I said, no, don't go. Don't go. You irritate me when you're here, but don't go either. Amen. But, um, but Michelle is home with Jacob today. He was up all night last night, literally with, uh, I don't know if it's a stomach illness or whatever he's got going on, but uh, keep him in your prayers if you would, please. And I'm going to try to uh, go home right immediately after service here after I talk to a couple people and then uh, try to pick them up and come back for Brother Lucky's uh, graduation here. Amen. But uh, I, um, I, I want to, I, something's been on my heart. I've been working on this message for about a month now. Just little parts, little bits. And, you know, the Bible says here a little, there a little. Amen. And then God brings forth this stuff. And I, and I want to preach a message today that's, um, well, I'm just going to get into the word of the Lord. Give me Judges chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. We're going to read that. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never, listen now, this is God talking here. I will never break my covenant with you. Now listen, we break covenant all the time. We just, let's be honest with you, if we're holding deals with God, we don't do a very good job of it. But fortunately, God does do a very good job of holding deals with us. Amen. And uh, verse 2 says, And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? It says, Wherefore... I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. The place there called Bochim means the place of weeping. The place where we weep. Amen. God's saying, listen, man, you've had these idols in front of you and you've let the idols come before me. Amen. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we put stuff in way of God. We put things and stuff and things take more priority than God does. And he's saying, when you do that, you're breaking my covenant. Now, I'm not going to break it with you, but he says, there's a wherefore to it, though. Because of that, I have to pull away my blessing from you. Amen. Because the idol became more important, come on, than me. It's really simple stuff. It's not very hard. Amen. If the idol takes place in me, and that means, let me, let me tell you what an idol is. Let me, you, you can be seated. I don't want you all standing here. Let, let me tell you what an idol is. I've got another scripture to read. An idol is anything that you place in front of God. It can be anything that takes the place of God in your life. Whatever we do, sports can be an idol to us. Media can be an idol to us. Anything that's not necessarily sin of itself, but if it takes the place of God, becomes sin. Can, can I say it like that? When There was a time in the Old Testament when God told him, he said, Listen, I'm, you all made a golden calf here. Let me show you what I'm going to do to this thing. He ground it to powder. Amen. He put it in the waters and said, Now I want you to drink it. He said, I want you to drink up your idol. Amen. Because it would come a part of you. And he said, it wasn't that gold was the problem that they made it out of. It wasn't the gold that was the problem. Is that they took the gold and they formed an idol out of the gold. Gold was a medium of exchange, just like money is today. Anything like we have of finances or whatever, it's just a medium of exchange that we use to buy and sell with. Gold was used in very much the same way. It was used for tools. It was used for equipment. It was even used in a tabernacle. It wasn't that gold was the problem. It was what they did with it was the problem. Do you understand how God works here? Not everything is a sin, folks. 
But we can make it a sin. We can cause issues that need not to be issues in our life because we put idols in the place of God. And an idol is anything, number one, that keeps us out of the house of God. It has become an idol to us because we have replaced God with something else. I know churches that have literally canceled their services for the Super Bowl. Are you kidding me? Or they'll have Super Bowl service. Well, everybody gets to go to the church to watch the Super Bowl. Sorry, but you put something in front of God to me. We have to be careful with idols. Because, see, idols don't necessarily thwart the work of God, but they can hinder the work of God in our lives. Give me John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace in the world. You shall have... Everybody say that word with me. Everybody say trouble. Trouble. You know where the word tribulation comes from? It's a word that they use to describe a farm implement. When they would thresh wheat... They would also use something called a tribulum. It was something that was used to cut free the seed from the plant itself. And it literally was something that hacked away even at the plant itself. Almost like a... Oh, brother, I'm not really good at in here, but almost like a, a, something you would drag behind something that causes something to get roughed up, amen, and torn apart. Sometimes God, He knocks some stuff loose from us. He said, this world, you're going to have tribulation. He said, but be of good cheer, because I, say I, have overcome the world. Amen. That's what Jesus said. I've overcome the world. You see, tribulation sometimes comes because we put it there, and sometimes the world puts it there. Come on. Sometimes the devil puts it there. You know, the Bible says we've got three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Folks, the devil doesn't do everything. Sometimes it's the world that does it. And sometimes it's our own flesh. Amen. I want to preach for just a few moments today about an arrogant world. Let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, there is nobody above you here today. And Lord, we thank you for your word that's truly forever settled in heaven. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we bless you, and we glorify your holy name. Lord, we ask now that your divine hand will be upon this service, upon your people here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to load you up with statistics. Usually they bore me to death. I'm being honest. I'm not a statistics preacher. I'm just not. Usually I just find them tedious and... Well, boring. But today I need a few of them. Today I'm going to have to ask that you bear with me for a few moments. Because the Bible makes it clear that we have three enemies. The world. If you don't know what the worldly enemy is, let me tell you what it is. It's when you're so hung up on what the world thinks about you. That you don't care about what God thinks about you. Let me say it again. Everybody else does it. Can I say it like that? Why don't you? I want to fit in. That's what it means. I want to be like everybody else. That's what it means. That's what it means to have a worldly influence. If everybody else is wearing this or doing this or watching this or doing that, then that is a worldly influence. Amen? That's why Jesus said He had overcome The world. Why? Because he walked amongst them and he said, if I can overcome it because you have my spirit dwelling in you, then you can overcome it. That's why we can't overcome it without God's help. We're not strong enough on our own. We just aren't. I'm sorry, folks. We are not strong enough on our own to overcome the world. Because the world beckons us on every turn. Everybody wants to be accepted. I don't care who you are in this place. We all want to feel the, accept, uh, the acceptance, not exception, but the acceptance 
of others. It's nice to be part of the in crowd. But God said, I hate to break the news to you, with dealing with Him, you're going to be part of the out crowd. He said, the world hated me. Amen. He said, the world hated me. He said, be of good cheer. I overcame the world. Amen. And if I can overcome the world, then you can overcome the world. He said, it hated me long before it ever hated you. Amen. Folks, what I'm trying to tell you is, is we can become overcome here today. Amen. By the blood of the Lamb. Because we deal with an arrogant world. You know, I was just looking at the last so-and-so years of American history, and I was just corresponding with for how we have changed over the years. And we've talked about it, those that have been serving God for any period of time, how God used to move or how God used to do things and why we don't see it as much anymore. And we, and we come up with all kind of ideals. Man, we're just to the point where it's, you know, well, uh, let's just be honest. Let's throw a few of them out there. We've, we've got the idea, well, the, it's because we don't pray like we used to because we're too busy. And there's the truth to this. I'm not, I'm not saying all the, I believe all these little things come together and make the fool, to be honest with you. We become too, we become, uh, our, our minds and our focus have shifted to everything but God because we become too busy in our minds with all kind of stuff. Amen. We have a breakdown of the American family. That's part of it. There's, there's a lot of things, amen, that takes place, amen, that's causing it. Amen. But I'll tell you the main thing, and we're going to get into that right here. You know, back in the 1950s, in my opinion anyway, I, I might be wrong on this, but I, I just don't think I am. Um, no, I'm not saying I'm not right all the time. Don't get me wrong. I just, I just, I think history is proving it here, in America at least. Because, you know, the world is really big on putting up neon signs. When it wants you to know something, man, it'll slap it on a neon sticker somewhere. Just to say, dun, 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 look at me. If it wants to show it up and show it out, it'll be on every container, it'll be on every lunch box, it'll be on every everything you see, everything you hear, everything you want. The world will lay it out there for you to see. They'll package it and they'll get it out as fast as possible. <clears throat> because that's how the world operates. The Bible makes it clear and lets you see that prayer is such a powerful focus in our life that we need to pray. That's why Jesus said, men always ought to pray and fail not. He said, don't faint to pray. Pray always. Pray always. Pray always. Make prayer a priority in your life. Even if you have to carve out time for it. Carve out time to pray. Let me say it again. Let me emphasize it. Pray, pray, pray. Because the one place in your life the enemy will fight you, it is on your prayer life. The one thing he tries to take away is the time that you take to pray. That's why the Bible said the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person, a righteous man, availeth much. Why? Because even if your prayer is only five minutes that you can get away and do it, as long as it's effectual and it's fervent, amen, that's what God is looking for. He's not looking for vain repetition for you saying, Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. What he's looking for is saying, Lord, my heart, amen, is towards you. I need direction for another day. I need help for another day. I need your power. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your strength. I need your help. I'm dependent upon you. Not about trying to find pretty words in the dictionary that you can use before God. It's about my heart saying, Lord, I need you. Would you please come and help me again? You see, in 1960, I think it was 1963, it was 1962 when it really began, but in 1963, Madeline Mary O'Hare won a lawsuit against the Baltimore school system, which voted in her favor 8-1 to to ban school prayer and label it as unconstitutional in schools. But not all prayer was immediately banned from schools at that time. Through a process of time, almost all school prayer is banned today. And that's the individual themselves want to do it. I'm talking in a corporate sense. They can't ban the individual from doing it. But in a corporate sense, they can. So the kids are being forced to pray. Well, not really. They didn't have to pray. They could just sit there. 
Well, the teacher prayed. But there was a time America prayed in school. It didn't take much long that when prayer fell in 1963, immediately one year afterwards. One, let me say this, one year. Bibles were taken out. It was unconstitutional to have a Bible. Amen. You can't read your Bible here. The individual could, but not as a corporate setting. Because now they're trying to make it like a history book or something and trying to find ways to get it in now. For 15 years before 1963, pregnancies in girls aged 15 through 19 years had been no more than 15 per thousand. Per thousand. After 1963, pregnancies increased 187% in the next 15 years. For younger girls aged 10 to 14 years, pregnancies since 1963s are up 553%. 553%. I'm not even going to say that because they got kids here. I'll leave that one to some other. Before 1963, divorce rates had been declining for 15 years. After 1963, divorce rates increased 300% each year for the next 15 years. Since 1963, unmarried people living together is up 353%. Since 1963, single parent families are up 140%. Since 1963, single parent families with children are up 160%. Now, I'm not pointing fingers here. Don't think I'm doing that. I'm just giving you stats of what they're saying. The education standard of measure has been the SAT scores. SAT scores have been steady for many years before 1963, with only a little variation up or down in between. From 1963, they have rapidly declined for 18 consecutive years even though the same test has been used since 1941. In 1974 and 75, this rate of decline of the SAT scores decreased, even though they continued to decline. That was when there was an explosion, listen now, of private religious schools. There were only 1,000 Christian schools in 1965. Between 1974 to 1984, they increased to 32,000. Because people wanted prayer. Of the nation's top academic scholars, three times as many come from private religious schools, which operate on one third the funds as do the public school system. One third the funds. Now I'm not running for politics here. Don't don't. I'm just giving the statistics. From a national point of view. In 1963, violent crime has, since 1963, violent crime has increased 544%. 544%. Illegal drugs has been an uncontrollable problem since. The nation has been deprived of an estimated 30 million citizens through legal abortion since 1973. Since 1963, America has not only taken prayer out of our schools, but we have well, I'm just going to say it like this because I don't even like using the word because I don't believe we we had never even considered losing a war up until that time. Not one time did we ever pull out without some kind of an agreement. In the 1960s, is it any wonder his prayer was taken out. But the drug culture hit the college scene. They became so prevalent then. They're, they've always been around. Don't get me wrong, folks. They ain't like to have them, but they've always been around. But never quite the way, amen, the sheer volume amen, that we see now. In the 1960s, it was in a college level. When the 1970s came, it went down to the high school level. When the 1980s came, it went to the junior high level. When the 1990s came, there were kids selling drugs to elementary school kids. And by the year 2000, it was in the womb. 
That's why I tell you it's time to pray. And don't stop praying. Don't quit praying. Because we serve, amen, a great God, but we live in an arrogant world. A world that likes to plaster everything, amen, all over the front page for the world to see. We live in an an arrogant world. I Even because you can always tell the temperature of the world because it's going to plaster it somewhere. If you want to know what's going on in the world, just take a good look around you and start paying attention to some things you see every now and then. Amen. What becomes popular, what becomes faddish, what becomes important, and that has any kind of real staying power. Now, I'm not talking about them spinny things and, you know what I mean, and all that kind of stuff. Go and yo-yos and all that. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about things that define a culture. Things that define a people. Things that define even a nation. Is it any wonder that before, amen, immediately after 1963 when the Bibles went out of the school, a little television show came on. A little television show came on about a lady that could twinkle her nose. Twinkle, twinkle, twinkle. All bewitched. Her name was Samantha. And she, I believe, had a mother or a mother-in-law named Endora. If it sounds familiar, it's because the story is familiar. Go to your Bible, you'll find it. A fellow by the name of Samuel and a witch by the name from Endor. Now, most people don't catch this stuff. I'm just... And some people, well, that's just coincidence. It may be. Who knows? I told you, it's an arrogant world. It's going to plaster it up there for everybody to see. Amen. But we're too busy looking at our idols or missing through our idols or seeking our idols that we don't see what God is trying to show us. Because the world will plaster it up there for you to see. Like I told you, it's not about the gold. Amen. It's what we make out of the gold. Amen. There's a big difference in taking a look at a little house on the prairie. Amen. It actually has a family value to it. It talks about family. It talks about the importance of those things. And somebody twinkling their nose and getting what they want. So it wouldn't take long when the Bible was to come out. Once we introduced that in 1965, just a year later, there came a genie out of a bottle. Now, most people think this stuff's innocuous, and to, compared to today, it is. Let's be honest. It's innocuous. But something was taking place, folks. As if the arrogant world was screaming, the drug culture's out of the bottle, baby. You thought you had us looked in, but we're not. Look where we're going. From the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. Because we're going to plaster it for everybody to see if you know what you're looking for. Amen. Well, you're just, preacher, you're just... You know, you're just being out there right now. You're just, you're just out there. You know, you're just taking TV shows and things you can find and just using them. I, I didn't, I didn't make them these years. That's when they came up. Amen. They're just, you know, I, I find it interesting. In, in 19, 1979, an album that went off the charts took over the American scene like no other album had in years before. A fellow by the name of Michael Jackson. Called Off the Wall. It was the name of the album. It was what was big. It wasn't on TV. We we're talking about something. I told you it's not about it's not about the gold. It's what the gold becomes. Do you understand that? It's not about the gold. It's what the gold becomes. It's what the idol becomes. So it became Off the Wall. You see, the last bastion schools still had, and even courts still had, and places still had was they still had something hanging on their walls called the Ten Commandments. At least we still got some moral code because it's got a moral message to it. Amen. Praise God. And so in 1979, they said, please, the world screamed out, please take it off the wall. In 1980, it came off the wall. They took the Ten Commandments from off the wall. Oh, Brother D, that's just coincidence. No, it's an arrogant world. I could cite more stuff here, folks. I, I could go into the 70s and stuff. I, I just didn't want to hit you with statistics all day long. But it's an arrogant world. 
that cries out every day. If you're not paying attention, you're going to miss it. Not much long after that, that your America goes and starts going into moral decay. We say, well, Garth Brooks said in the 1990s we don't need fences either. And so it walked into our churches. The churches that used to teach holiness walked away from it. That believed in it. That believe in holiness. All of a sudden, great falling away starts becoming into the church world. Churches that used to teach certain things don't teach it anymore. I'm not talking about stuff that's not specifically written. I'm talking about stuff that's specifically written in Scripture. I'm not talking about the gray area stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that's completely written in Scripture. And we just make it whatever we want to make it because it just sounds good. It was part of their culture. It was this. It was No, it's the Word of God and it does not change. Who needs fences? I'll tell you who needs fences. We still need them. You go to any daycare in America and tell them to take away the fence. Every mother in the world will be screaming at them. You go to any prison system in America and you say, take away the fence. And somebody's going to be screaming, hey, put that fence back up. We need fences for certain things. Not fences. Not all fences are bad. Some fences make for good neighbors. Why? Because I want to tell you something. He been. It's an arrogant world. And they said unto you, you don't need fences at your church. Oh, Brother D, you're just using stuff. You're just, you're out there, Brother D. No, I'm not. You think I'm kidding you? Okay. Let's talk about America again, shall we? It didn't take a few more years right after that. When the fences came down in the churches, that all of America got to be real arrogant. Got to declare to the whole world what we're doing. And we called it American Idol. We even called it out so arrogantly. Declared it unto God. It's an idol. You can be great. Your name can be in lights. You can be on stage. The whole world can adore you. Because the world is arrogant. And it'll scream it out to you. If you're listening. But see, when our ears are stopped and our pulpits are silent, this won't be one of them. And they're just, they can call me what they want to call me. I'm I'm okay with it. But I'm telling you, hey man, you better find a place to pray and learn how to pray again. You better find a place in your life, amen, where prayer is a priority, amen. You gotta find a place where you learn how to get a hold of God again, amen. Or I want to tell you something, the world's gonna sweep you away and you're not gonna know how you got there. But I want to tell you something, amen. It's got a, the world's got a powerful spirit to it. Don't think it don't. Uh, Cry out to me for acceptance because if somebody else is doing it somehow, it'll make it okay for you. If somebody, all you gotta look for is a crowd to do it with. Amen? Because you'll find acceptance uh, in that crowd. Amen? Young ladies, can I say something here, mom, without y'all going off on me here? Can I just, I have to be careful how I say this. I have young people here. But some of you young ladies, hear me when I say this. Until he says I do, you don't. Is that okay with everybody? <laughs> Wish my daughter was here right now because I tell her. I have no problem saying it. Because this worldly spirit cries out and says, It's okay. It's all good. Everything's fine. It's okay. It's all good. It's all, now listen, I'm not trying to point fingers. Don't, I'm not here to point at anybody. I'm not doing that. I'm trying to tell you what the worldly spirit says is acceptable. Doesn't mean it's acceptable in God's eyes. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. Because this world is so arrogant. It'll plaster it all over the place. It'll plaster it all over the place. 
It'll pla- Listen, I've been caught up in the world spirit before. Come on. Oh, brother. Dear. Yeah, I have. You kidding me? Can I, can I tell you what? I, I'm going to one more stat and I'm done with stats. I promise. The complaints of teachers before 1962, before prayer was even attacked. You know what the top five complaints were from the teachers? Talking, chewing gum, making noise, running the halls without a hall pass, and getting out of turn in line. Because apparently they didn't know how to follow the line leader. The top five complaints of teachers today. Rape, robbery, assault, burglary, and arson. Because the world screams. And it's so arrogant. It's so arrogant. It's so arrogant. It cries out and it yells as loud as it can. You don't need to go to church tonight. American Idol's on tonight. Well, you don't need, you don't need to, Brother D, now you're just being mean. Don't you know the Reds are playing today? I mean, after all, Brother D, it is the Super Bowl. I'm sorry, it ain't the Super Bowl for me. But God, you case. Don't care. Church is here. I'm going to be here. I don't care what game or whatever it is. I'm going to be here. Folks, I want you to understand something. It's an arrogant world. Because you see, the enemy himself is arrogant. It's just an offshoot of him and how he operates. He's arrogant. In fact, one of the earmarks of the devil is his arrogance. When people have an arrogant spirit, you know the enemy is involved. That's why God tells us to what? Be humble. The Bible said that Moses was so powerful because of his meekness. You know what it means to be meek? Let me tell you what meekness is. Meek is not, listen now, meek is not some kind of shy guy that sits in the corner with his thumb like this. Yes, sir. No, sir. Meekness. Not mean weakness. Meekness is power under authority. Meekness is staying in your wattage, Brother Lonnie. Meekness is when this power supply only gives 120, you don't give 130. Meekness is staying in your lane. Meekness is knowing that you're not God and He is. Meekness is realizing that we walk by faith and not by sight. Meekness is realizing that God can take care of any situation. Meekness is realizing, amen, that you're just a man, but He is everything. Meekness is realizing, amen, that God is large and in charge. That He is in control of everything that's going on around you. And that you neither create nor finish anything. He does. He's the one that said he was the author and the finisher of our faith. If he allows it in our life, we're supposed to learn from it. Amen. Or it's meant to help us in some way, shape, or form, even when I don't understand it. I've had events happen in my life where I've looked at God and said, Lord, what are you doing? It doesn't make any sense at all to me. I've had times where I've felt flat out cheated before. I've had times in my walk with God and I said, Lord, I have no clue what you are up to. But I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Y'all got to help me right now. But God knows everything. He is far above my understanding. His ways are so far from me finding out. Man, I'm just so glad he lets me along for the ride. That he'll use a sorry vessel like me. For he is perfect in all of his ways. 
You know, I... Book of Judges, chapter chapter 1, I guess, verse, verse 2. A nation that was marked by God's glorious conquests. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land. They say, you did it. He said, he did it. He said, I have delivered the land into his hand. Judah said, you're going to go up and I'm going to deliver the land. Amen. In your hand. Give me verse 4. Because they enjoyed God's providence. That's when God just steps in and does God's stuff. I'm sorry, I got a better word for it, but that's the only way I can describe it because he does so many things. I just call it God's stuff. So Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand and they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. They enjoyed God's power. But in verse 19, same verse. Now listen, 15 verses later, didn't take long. And the Lord was with Judah and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. In other words, there were some things they were willing to live with. You see, they enjoyed God's protection, but there were some things they were still willing to live with. They also enjoyed God's promises. You see, I could go down a few more verses and you'll find out where they failed God. And they didn't enjoy God's providence and they didn't enjoy God's power. They didn't enjoy this. They didn't enjoy that. But, what about a few verses later? God said, that's okay. You've fallen, but you can get up. And God said, I'll show you my providence. I'll show you my power. I'll show you my protection and my promises again. You see, folks, there are times I have missed the billboard that the world has screamed out to me. I've missed it before. I can't sit there and say I haven't. I've missed it. I have missed it. It's like driving by and missing the road sign somewhere. Every now and then I'll miss a road sign. I don't know what's going to be the next billboard the world's going to show to us. Maybe it's going to be making America great again. I don't know. This ain't a political message. Don't think it is. It's not. Who knows what it's going to be? I don't have a clue. But I know it's going to come up somewhere. Because we live in an arrogant world. It's going to come up somewhere. It's going to let you know your spiritual condition of this world by the sign it puts on the wall. The question is for you, is what is your spiritual condition? What signs are up on your wall? Have you taken prayer out of your life? Have you taken the Bible out of your life? Well, have you stopped worshiping God from this pulpit up here and now you're the American Idol? I don't know. But I know this much. Amen. Be careful. It's an arrogant world. I want you all to stand with me. This is different for me using all these stats. But Jesus said it this way, and this is the part I like the most. Be of good cheer. The world hated me long before it ever even thought of you. But I, he said, have overcome the world. Because he has overcome, you can overcome the world. You don't have to bow down every time they say it's time to bow. When they say jump, you don't have to say how high. You're not in the business of giving in to the world's demands. 
You serve a very holy God that loves you, that cares about you, that thinks you're absolutely special. Brother Lucky plays right now. I want him to come and to minister to us as we open up these altars today. So I'm going to ask you, how's your spiritual condition? So I've been working on this thing for about a month. I didn't know when I was going to preach it. But last week, I was at work. I was knowing I was going to preach Sunday. I was I had like three different messages. I didn't know which one I was going to preach, and I just said, "Lord, I don't know what to preach." And usually, what that means is on the last day or the last night, or the last hour before service, He'll tell me. But I heard a scream in my ear: the arrogance of a world. These altars are open. If you'd like to come and pray, we're not here to judge you, but we are here to help you. We're not here to condemn you, but we are here certainly to pray with you. Jesus loves you, and so do we. These altars are open. Brother Lucky, would you just play, please?